Good morning, guys. We didn't want to have to do this, but um, uh, it's better than nothing. So we're going to have church at home with our families and just join our First Baptist Church family uh, via the Internet. And uh, so we're least thankful we able to do that. And um, uh, we just want to have a couple of announcements. We're going to preach here or teach a devotional out of Isaiah chapter 45 here in just a little bit. Um, but first, what we want to do is we want to go and uh, have just a couple an announcement, prayer, and then we're going to sing a hymn together. So um, uh, the announcements are we're going to go week by week as we do what we can to get back in the church. Uh, I can't imagine us being back in church together next Sunday, but who knows? I'd rather cancel it week to week just in case uh, some amazing good news comes out uh, more quickly so you'll hear probably Thursday or Friday a uh, decision on what we'll do for next Sunday um, also if you want to give uh, to the church and by all means I hope that uh, you continue to do that we want to uh, say that you can give either by um, sending it through the mail and uh, Melissa is also at the office from 9 to 2 uh, Monday through Thursday and then we also have a donate button on our church website, uh, fb, fbcwilliamson.com. Um, so with that being said, let's go together and sing uh, Be Thou My Vision.
wonderful hymn, Be Thou My Vision, is. And we certainly need the Lord to be our guide and our vision for this this time and the things that are going on. We certainly seem to be quite blinded. Uh, let's take a moment and have prayer, and then we're going to have our Bible study from Isaiah 45. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give thanks, Lord, for all things. And we want to thank you even for this time, Lord. In fact, we probably better thank you for this time. And see this as an opportunity, Lord, to shine as the people of God, to shine as those that are saved by Jesus Christ, Lord. We want to express great confidence in you, Lord. We want to proclaim the gospel in the hardest of times, Lord. And and um, and we are in uncertain times and fearful times and anxious times. And God, may it not be so with us. And we know there is some some fear to be had in terms of just not knowing what, what, what is going to happen. But this we know, Lord, that you are kind and gracious and merciful and you take care of your people to the very end, Lord, that you will see us through the hardest times. And so I pray, God, this will be an opportunity for our faith to grow and for us to shine as a witness to the gospel in this world today. So be with us, I pray, in that. We want to hold high Jesus Christ and the gospel. We want to lift high the cross, God, as the only way of salvation for people. We want to pray for your will to be done, no matter what. That's our main prayer, God, for your will to be done. You see things we don't see, but I know, Lord, we have needs. And, Lord, we don't. We want our people to be healed and our land to be healed. Uh, we want the world's suffering to stop as, regard, as, as is regarding this, uh, this illness, God, that's going to so many people. And so we pray, Father, uh, that you might lift that uh, from us, God, and be merciful and gracious, we pray, God. Be with our church, Lord. All these that are worshiping this morning, just your special blessing upon them. Um, may you lead us in worship, God. May you comfort us by the truth of the scriptures. So we give thanks for these things and we pray them in Jesus' name. And amen. All right, let's take a moment and go to Isaiah 45. I'm sure you're ready to go. And we're going to read verses 7 to 9. So let's go. The Bible says this, I form light and create darkness. I make success and create disaster. I am the Lord who does all these things. Heavens sprinkle from above and let the skies shower righteousness. Let the earth open up so that salvation will sprout and righteousness will spring up with it. I, the Lord, have created it. Woe to the one who argues with his maker, one clay pot among many. Does clay say to the one forming it, what are you making? Or does your work say he has no hands? May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his holy and inerrant word. Um, so we're going to talk about God's sovereignty today. I think this is very important for us to get a grasp of in such uncertain times, such fearful and anxious time. Uh, it's imperative that we revisit this truth of God's sovereignty. It seems like it's on our lips quite often here at First Baptist Church because we believe in a sovereign God in heaven who's never surprised and all that. But it's just important for us to take a closer look in times like this that we may be comforted and that we may share with others uh, in that comfort. Um, um, one of the things that the truth of the sovereignty of God does, and it does these three things, and I want to mention them quickly and then go into the study and then come back to them. But it does three things that understanding the sovereignty of God does three things for the believer. It provides it provides us with the greatest comfort. It provides the Christian with unshakable confidence. And thirdly, it supplies us with uncommon courage. And I just want to go over those three things quickly before we get into the Bible study. It is the greatest comfort because God loves us and He cares for us. We can know God. God's love is on us um, uh, when we understand the truth of His sovereignty, that He has created us and fashioned us and made us for Himself. He's reached down and saved us from our sins, and He has eternal life for us. His gift to us is that we are part of His family, adopted in, we're given an inheritance. And in fact, in a way, He is our inheritance. When we have eternal life, our great reward is actually Him. And so we know God loves us and He cares for us. And as Christians, we may know that our, our lives are in the kind and caring hand of God. He has a plan 
for his people, even as the world seems to be spiraling out of control. God has a a loving plan for his people, and that's important to know. He's a loving father to us, and he always gives us better things than we have ever deserved. Whatever we would go through in this life in terms of hardship, we could never say that we never deserved worse. God's been kind to us and loving to us and given so many good things, and we want to be a people that talks about the love of God. Secondly, we get an unshakable confidence because of the promises that God has for us when we understand the sovereignty of God. He has we there are promises that God's made. He cannot fail. There are things that God cannot do, and He cannot lie. Um, God cannot lie. He cannot break a promise. We have unshakable confidence because the sovereign God of heaven makes these promises. He's able to keep all of His promises for us because He's the Almighty God of heaven. Thirdly, we may have uncommon courage because God is sovereign. Nothing will thwart his will thwart his purposes. God will be glorified no matter what. We were made as his people. We were made to reflect that glory. Nothing that happens to us will be because that God failed us or because he was unknowing or that he was uncaring or that he was unable. All of history is working towards this one unalterable goal, the fulfillment of God's purposes, the purposes of God uh, for His own glory. And that causes us to lift our heads high and have great courage in the most difficult times that we may face. And uh, uh, in, in uncertain times, in fearful times, we can have great courage um, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to now take and do um, uh, examine God's sovereignty from four perspectives. And uh, so here we go. Here's the first one. If you're taking notes, and I hope that you, go, you are, and then you guys can look in the Bible together. And the first place we're going to go is the Genesis 1-1. And where we find that God is sovereign over creation. So that's the first thing we need to understand. God is sovereign over creation. Uh and that, well, how we can know that and be helped by that is to understand what the Bible has to say for us. Um, in the book of Genesis, in chapter 1 and verse 1, the Bible says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God created the heavens and the earth. This stuff wasn't here. Uh, it hasn't been here eternally. It was out of nothing that God made everything at one time and at one point. There was nothing here, and God took nothing and made everything that is right now. He created it ex nihilo, out of nothing. And that's the power of the sovereign God. He takes nothing, and He makes everything. It's quite remarkable. This is part of Him being almighty and all sovereign. Everything we now know that exists, matter, space, time, energy, all of these things, Um, God created them. The will to create also was entirely God's. It was not imposed upon Him. He had no need to do it. Um, He didn't create us because He was lonely. He didn't, someone else didn't force Him to create. God created because God wanted to. Now, then we see that all things were created by God in Jesus Christ for Jesus Christ. Let's look at uh, Colossians um, chapter uh, 1 there. So if you'll turn to Colossians chapter 1, and then we're going to read verses 15 to 17. And here's what the Word of our God says here in first uh, in Colossians uh, 1 verses um, 15 through 17. He is speaking of Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by Him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and by Him all things hold together. We learn a lot from that verse in terms of the purposes of God for creation. Um, And so... uh, All things, the reason that all things exist is because of Him. And it's all for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all for Him. That means that our own individual purposes cannot be separated from the purposes of God. We are made for Him. 
We're made by Him, and we're made for Him. Uh, and we're made for His glory. All right, so God is sovereign in, in the creation. Secondly, we want to understand that God is sovereign in providence. You understand what we mean when we say providence? This is the way in which God is working through the world. God does not create and then leave everything up to chance. He doesn't set things in motion and then back off as if he has nothing else to do uh, with his creation. No, God guides his creation through his through what we call providence. And so this is important as it relates to us now, very important. And one of the reasons why I chose to do this Bible study, uh, because we need to understand in anxious and fearful times that none of what happens in life surprises our God. None of it happens because He's not able. That's the other thing, you know. Uh, we can't say where is God. God is on the throne, and He is taking care of His uh, of His creation through His wise providence. Psalm one fifteen verse three says, "Our God is in the heavens; He does whatever He pleases." Our passage is our passage in Isaiah forty five said that He makes success and creates disaster. He opens the heavens according to His sovereign will. Proverbs 16.33 tells us that the lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. We are told that the footsteps of the righteous are ordered. The scriptures assure us time and time again that history is unfolding in the perfect plan of God. He is sovereign through providence. Now, how does that benefit us? Well, because God has made certain promises to us, we can have confidence in the midst of the greatest perils and the greatest uncertainty and the greatest trials of our lives. Knowing God is sovereign in life's events has led so many men and women to be courageous in the most dangerous of times. And we have that confidence and courage that God is working all things out for His glory and that He remembers us. I'm reminded uh, of how in the uh, times of the, the, the Christians were suffering under Roman persecution, uh, under so many different emperors, and sometimes it was really hard persecution. Other times it was lighter persecution, but it seems for the first 300 years of Christianity's existence, it was constantly uh, under persecution. And there's that one story of, of, uh, of a lady named Perpetua who had a young child, and she was imprisoned for um, being a Christian and separated from her child. And she was given the death sins. And they bring her into the courtroom and and um, and and tell her, you know, they plead with her. They brought her father in there to plead. Just offer incense to the gods. Just, uh, just do that. Just say Caesar is Lord. Just offer incense to the gods. And you can be with your child. And she said, I'll not do that. I'll never do that. And she held her head high and went and went to death. Why is that? Because she knew that God was sovereign in providence. She knew that he kept his promises. You can think of the great English reformer, William Tyndale, who, of course, translated the Bibles into English and became public enemy number one for King Henry VIII. And he had to go in hiding to, to do this. And over a decade, he hid before they finally caught him and arrested him and he was in jail and they're getting ready to to execute him and what's his what's his words you know here you you give an I've an opportunity to recant and say no the, the king is right now uh, let me go and Tyndale's final prayer is uh, um, uh, God please open the eyes of the king quite remarkable how can you do that the way that you can do that and the way that you can face such hard times is to know that God is sovereign. If he wasn't sovereign, if you doubted that, you couldn't you couldn't handle that. You couldn't you couldn't say those things. But because you know God is taking care of you in the hardest of times, uh, you can go with that. Let's uh, look at a very famous passage that has to go with this. You can go to Romans chapter eight and um, this is one that's just so easy to go to and important to go to in times like these. And uh, I want to read 28 and then skip down to 35 to 39. We'll read a little after 28 in the next one. But uh, 
But in Romans 8, 28, we want to read that, that famous verse. It says, We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to His purposes. All things, even this trouble we're going through with this virus in the land and, and the uncertainty, not just from the virus, but the economic uncertainty going forward and so many people affected by this. Uh, we can look at Romans 8, 28 and say that, see that people like Paul had it much harder than us and, there, and he was able to say all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. He says, we know this. And then if you'll go down to verse um, um, 35 in that, uh, you'll see something uh, as well. Look at this. He says there, uh, Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it's written, because of you we're being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in these things we are more. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now get this. He says this, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus our Lord. So there you have it. Um, and church, I hope that what this is for you is great comfort and courage in these dark times of uncertainty. Uh, God is on the throne, and uh, we can be sure of that no matter what happens. Uh, thirdly, God is sovereign in salvation. It's important for us to understand that. It's important for us to know that God is going to save His people. How wonderful is it, church, that God came looking for us. Isn't that wonderful? For we surely did not look for Him. The Bible describes, and we know this because the Bible describes us as thoroughly corrupted by sin. We are in rebellion and we're pictured as running from God. Um, not to him. Perhaps the most clear picture of God's sovereignty and salvation is that of Saul of Tarsus. And I'm sure you remember uh, Saul of Tarsus there, that he hated, uh, he hated Christ. He hated the church. Um, he was throwing Christians in jail, and he was breathing murder against them. And then one day, as he's on his way to Damascus to uh, imprison more Christians. The Bible says that a light from heaven flashed around him and that he fell on the ground and a voice said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And quite frankly, uh, quite forcefully, God saved him from his sins. Paul wasn't going uh, to look for the church meeting. He was on his way breathing murder and God reached down and saved him from his sins. And I was talking to someone about their salvation experience, and they said, uh, and as they were, uh, before they had become a Christian, that they were grappling with sin, and God and His conviction, uh, it appeared to them that they were, that, that they are getting saved was all about whether that the, He would walk down the aisle and receive Christ. You know, will I walk down that aisle, will I receive Christ, and all that stuff. But it was later on that He saw all along how it was that God was guiding him along, and it was God who saves us. You know, you're there in Romans, and uh, just want to look at uh, 28 through 30 again there. He, he, he says, We know all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. Then he says, For those He foreknew, He predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those He predestined, He called. Those He called, He justified. Those He justified, He glorified. Uh, and then you look over in Romans 9 and look at this at, at verses 15 and 16. And you can turn the page there and see what it says. Um, For he tells Moses, I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it does not depend on human will or effort, but on God who shows mercy. It's God who shows mercy. Salvation is of the Lord. And then one more in John chapter 1, and I'll read that uh, quickly there in verse um, um, uh, 12, uh, verse 11. He says, He came to His own. His own people did not receive Him. But to all who did receive Him, He gave them the right to be the children of God, to those who believe in His name, who were born, not of natural descent, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. So salvation 
is of the Lord. Let us give thanks to the sovereign God of heaven who rescues us from our sins. And then finally, God is sovereign in judgment. No one will escape having to face the Almighty God on judgment day. No one will fa- will escape that. You know, Hitler averted no judgment when he killed himself before Allied forces could come in and arrest him and cause him to stand trial and give an account for his crimes. He only escaped the sentencing of natural men, mortal men. He will stand before the Almighty God of heaven and he will receive his just punishment. And so too will everyone that refuses to come to the only way of salvation for all mankind. Because the Bible says that it is appointed for a man to die once and then the judgment. How wonderful are these times that we live in. That the gospel message of salvation in Christ alone is trumpeted so that you and I can hear it. How wonderful is that? That many times people went without ever hearing about the word of the Lord and they went on in their sins and in their rebellion against the God that had created and fashioned them. And they loved their sins and were darkened in their minds and had no gospel and no Bible to light their minds and light their way. And here we are in this day and time, in the most anxious of times, and we have God's word. And we have preachers who preach faithfully the gospel message that Christ died for sinners. A wonderful time to hear. You know, we get to hear that Christ alone is the sal- is the salvation uh, for sinners. And, uh, uh, and so it's a wonderful time. It's evidence of God's mercy and of His grace uh, being sovereignly bestowed upon us. So let us hear the gospel. Let us turn to Christ. Let us believe upon His name. Let's repent of our sins and trust Him. And if you've never done those things on this day, I urge you, trust in Jesus Christ. He is the only way of salvation. You turn from your sins and believe only in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. So here's how I close. I want to take you back to those three things I said. If we'll understand the sovereignty of God, they'll do three things for you uh, in this life today. One is it'll give you great comfort in these anxious times. Great comfort. Great comfort in the love of God. He loves you. and He will always be there for you. Secondly, it will give you unshakable confidence. God is sovereign. He makes promises He cannot break. Trust in His name. Rest in His promises. Even if you go to the grave in a hard, hard way, God is there for you. He raises even the dead up from the grave and gives you an inheritance, an eternal life with Him. And then thirdly, He gives you uncommon courage. We can stand up in this day and age in a time of fear and anxiety. Hold our head high because we know God's going to accomplish all of His plan. We know that no matter what happens to us, He'll raise us up from death. We know our great God in heaven is on the throne. He's in control. And there's nothing, nothing, nothing that can stop Him. So be comforted, dear church, by the sovereignty of God. Um... We'll continue. Maybe we'll have a Bible study Wednesday night uh, for you as well. So uh, more about that later. But at this time, let's just have prayer and then go to our final hymn um, and uh, conclude our worship time together. This is my prayer. It'll be, and then the hymn will be the final the final thing. So, so God bless you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just ask that uh, this great confidence, that we would all have great confidence in, the, in your sovereignty, Lord that we will trust in you, and that above all things, Lord, uh, that these things will be a great comfort to us. May Christ be glorified in our lives. Thank you, and God bless. Enjoy the hymn, Not in Me. Sing it with your family. I'm sure you know it. God bless.
Yes, sir.